For growing numbers of white Britons, fantasies about hot interracial sex only made them want the real thing. To do that, they had to travel abroad, where a whole new world of erotic possibility was opening up. The empire was moving into Africa. For many of the British colonial officers posted there, the temptation was going to prove too much. By the end of the 19th century, Britain was taking over large swathes of Africa, including today Zimbabwe, Kenya and Uganda. The carve-up had a side benefit. Interracial desire could at last become a reality. For some of Britain's colonial elite, a posting to some far-flung dominion might not be quite so hellish after all. You could almost think of it as a sex safari. It's almost like going to Mars, to a different planet, and finding out your astonishment and delight that the people were not just naked, but uh, the, they seemed to be welcoming at a sexual level, and more than that, you had power over them. It, it was a new world of sexual adventure. They knew they shouldn't, but they did. Typical of the new breed of administrator was Richard Meinertshagen, a 24-year-old British officer who arrived in the East Africa Protectorate, now Kenya, in 1902. Brought up a strict Christian, he believed in sexual restraint. He'd taken on board the Empire's cardinal rule, no sex with the natives. However, Minotargan was shocked to discover that the taboo was being broken extensively. Richard Minotargan discovers that all his brother officers appear to have African mistresses. There's definitely sexual relations going on. And Minot Hagen writes about these in his diaries and appears quite outraged by what he sees. On my arrival here, I was amazed and shocked to find that they all brought their native women into the mess. The talk centers around sex and money and is always connected with some type of pornography. Being very junior, I cannot do much about it. Soon after arriving, even Minot Hagen came perilously close to succumbing to the temptation on offer when he witnessed an erotic tribal dance. For a reserved young Brit, it must have been quite an eye-opener. The natives gave us a treat. A large party of young men and girls danced together for many a hot hour. To my mind, the dance was the most suggestive and immoral. I imagine the origin of all dancing is to incite or, or play on the sexual senses. In the dances I witnessed this afternoon, the last phase is the bolting of the lady into the bush, hotly pursued by the young man. A direct assault on my senses. Meinertshagen resisted the temptation throughout his five-year stay in Africa. But many of his fellow officers lacked his self-restraint. And it seems African women were often attracted to the colonizers as well. In certain African societies, whiteness is a blemish. In others, whiteness is just something to marvel at. When white people went, the natives fell on their knees and worshipped them <laughs> uh, as, as divinities. So obviously whiteness had a glamour and a sense of marvel. African women saw benefits in having relationships with local white men. They're not in these relationships because white guys are seen as sexier than black guys. In the archives, you get reports of African male elders saying to white administrators, you white men have taken all our women. Well, of course you will have done, because you have the power. And it's part of the way in which the African societies have been constructed that more powerful men 
have access to more women. But it wasn't just about power. African women had a freer, less restrained attitude to sex. A lot of what's going on in Europe is to do with controlling sexual desire. And a lot of what's called sexual morality is actually the policing of desire. Now, in African communities at the same time, there is no real interest in policing desire. There is an interest in policing sexual relationships in order to make sure that children are born appropriately, that lineages continue, but desire itself is treated in a much more pragmatic way. Sex is fine, sex is good, sex is celebrated in these societies. Girls are encouraged to learn techniques to make sure that they and their husbands have a good time when they're having sex. You cannot regulate desire. We have records of African men saying this repeatedly to white administrators. You cannot police desire. London was a long way away, and the colonial office had loftier matters to pursue. They turned a blind eye to their minions' interracial affairs, hoping to keep it quiet from the public at home. There was plenty to keep quiet about. In some cases, sex with the natives meant sex with children, as young as 13. There is the view that forbidden fruit is unblemished fruit. What Africa seemed to have offered to jaded appetites was the possibility of virgin flesh, new flesh, you know, flesh that had not yet been um, sullied by contact. But by 1908, a scandal was brewing, which would blow the secret into the open. A white landowner in Kenya, W. Scoresby Routledge, objected to colonials having sex with young local African girls. Routledge complained to colonial officials, but they continued to look the other way. In frustration, he wrote a furious letter to the Times denouncing the immorality he had witnessed. The secret of interracial sex in Africa had just become a public scandal. Routledge made this a truly public issue, took it out of the private domain of the corridors of Whitehall and into the public arena. So questions were asked in the House of Parliament, and in one sense, I suppose, the cat was let out of the bag. The government's policy of don't ask, don't tell was in tatters. A circular went out to all colonial officers, banning relationships with the natives. But with the secret out, a new public mood was taking hold in Britain.